Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ramton. I'm joined here today by Lawrence, Gabriel, Jessica, and Justin. And today we're going to be talking about fishing. We're going to be talking about the operational side of fishing. So it's a little bit more in depth. So we split this up into four phases. The first was OSINT. The second was social engineering. The third was fishing infrastructure. And the fourth was sending out the fish. Uh, before we get into this, though, we uh, Swift would just like to preface that Orbital Weapons, the company that we fished, is fictitious. Um, you don't want to be fishing or like attempting this at home because you will get in trouble. Uh, so don't do this. You will go to jail. Uh, next, you might see some weird text in the bottom left corner. Those are the MITRE attack um, tactics, you can say. Um, so what we did was map our strategies to these to the MITRE attack framework to help identify and analyze threat actor behavior. Lastly, um, since this is more of an offensive um, presentation, we would like to ask um, to for you to think about the defensive tactics that you can use to mitigate our strategies. So the scenario is that we were hired by Orbital Weapons to engage in a phishing assessment for employee awareness. Um, we did OSINT, we created phishing templates, and we hosted a fake domain on Apache to steal credentials, including um, two-factor. And um, the engagement lasted around five days from the 14th to the 19th. So now I'll pass it on to Lawrence to talk about OSINT. Thank you, Robinson. So OSINT is an acronym, and what it stands for is Open Source Intelligence. A good way to think of this is as sort of passive intelligence gathering that in which you search for information that could be publicly found on the internet. So a common way to do this is by looking at different social media sites of the employees of a company. Sites like Facebook and Instagram have people post a lot of things on their profiles, and they could inadvertently post sensitive information that could help a fisher make their uh, phishing links more relevant to a company. However, one of the best social media sites to look at is LinkedIn, because this site is more business related, which makes it so that you could generate a fish that looks extremely realistic due to its business nature. You could look at a company's organizational structure, find information on what positions are held to be the most credible, and generate a pretty realistic fish. So for this engagement, what we did was we looked at the LinkedIn profiles of several members of the company, Orbital Weapons. In this slide, we see two employees, Saul Silver and Chet Apichart. Saul Sulfur is the CEO of Orbital Weapons. So he's someone who's the authority figure of the company. And he's someone that we could impersonate. We also have Chet Apichart. He's the information technology engineer at Orbital Weapons. And we see that in his LinkedIn profile, he stated that he set up dual two-factor authentication and also implemented Office 365 single sign-on. So from this, we know that Chet Apichart implemented two-factor authentication. So if we generate a phishing link, we should be taking this into account and make it so that if they enter a fake website that we created, we also have a prompt that accepts two-factor authentication codes. We also know that they use Office, Microsoft Office 365. So our phishing emails should probably be sent using a Microsoft product like Outlook. In the next slide, we see two more employees. We have Ricky Jesperson and Jory Saltman. These are both employees of the Threat Intelligence Department of Orbital Weapons. Ricky Jesperson is the manager of the threat intelligence team, and she manages a threat intel intern, Jory Saltman. Jory Saltman is relatively new to the company, so he's not exactly very experienced with the inner workings of it. So he's someone that would be very um, susceptible to a phishing attack. And then lastly, we have Evelyn Sanders. She's the senior accountant and executive at Orbital Weapons. And she's been with the company for a really long time, 13 years and seven months to be exact. And due to her long years of experience with the company, she won't be susceptible to random phishing attacks because she will be able to see them as suspicious due to how experienced she is with how the company generates its uh, communications and reports. So to sum it all up, we found out that Orbital Weapons uses Outlook, that George Salman is an intern that works underneath Ricky Jesperson, that Saul Soper is the CEO of Orbital Weapons that we could use to impersonate, 
and that Evelyn Sanders is a longtime employee at Orbital Weapons. We also found Saul's email credentials in, at a site called Dotspin. It's a really shady site where people share all sorts of information about uh, uh, people, companies, etc. And what we found was that we found Saul Solper's email, which was saul.solper at orbitalweapons.com. So since we know the naming convention of their emails, we're able to either spoof or create similar looking emails and send out our fish like that. And now we're going to go more into target selection. So there's phishing is a really broad term. There's a lot of different types of phishing, like smishing, which is uh, text message phishing, or vishing, which is voice or like phone phishing. But when you're selecting a target, there's spear phishing and whaling. Spear phishing is when you're targeting a specific branch of a company or a company of itself. Contrary to a mass phishing attack, which seeks to get quantity over quality, you're prioritizing quality over quantity, making your fish more relevant to a company so that it's more realistic and hopefully getting targets like that. Whaling is when you target the CEOs of the company, the higher ups like the CEO, CFO, the people who have large amounts of resources and money that you could potentially steal from, from a successful attack. But for this engagement, what we're doing is a spear phishing engagement. In the next slide, we see all the targets of orbital weapons, Saul Soper, Chet Apachart, Ricky Jesperson, George Saltman, and Evelyn Sanders. Now, out of these five people, the person who probably won't be the most susceptible to a phishing attack would be someone who has lots of experience with the company. So people like Evelyn Sanders, Saul Soper, they'll be able to see a weak fish very easily and identify it as something suspicious and won't respond how we want them to. However, someone like Jory Saltman, who is an intern, is not familiar with the inner workings of the company. They're not as familiar with how the communications are supposed to be settled. So they might be somewhat more susceptible to a phishing attack, which is why it's good to prioritize more susceptible targets. Next, I'm going to pass it off to Jessica to walk you through some of the social engineering tactics that threat actors use in their phishing attacks. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Uh, second, now I would like to go over the um, social engineering psychological tricks that are often used um, in a phishing attack. So first of all, we have authority. This is usually used when you wanna use the uh, someone's authority to influence the judgment of a target. Uh, for example, using a CEO to kind of intimidate an intern into um, following the instructions on a phishing attack. Uh, there's also intimidation, which is kind of like authority, but it is more about the imposition of negative consequences in the event that the actions are not followed instead of using like an authoritative figure. Uh, next, we have consensus, which is using the influences of others. For example, claiming that um, a coworker usually uh, provides some sort of information, but they are un unreachable. So asking for that information wouldn't seem out of hand. Um, next, we have scarcity, which would be adding a time element to a phishing attack. Um, but this, it's more of like a, oh, this is a limited, limited time offer um, only. So please, um, you know, consider the offer. And then uh, it's kind of different from urgency, which we'll cover later. Uh, next, we have familiarity, which is um, keeping in mind and being aware of the relationships that are between um, each individual and, and the target and how it influence their, uh, their willingness to do something. Uh, next, we have trust, which is using a figure uh, that the victim trusts or kind of expects to hear from so that they're less alert um, or aware of an attack. For example, you can kind of like uh, impersonate someone that uh, the victim is expecting to hear from, and that will lower their awareness level. Um, next, we have urgency, which would be uh, using a threat of a deadline. Uh, to kind of put pressure on the victim and ma manipulate them into being less wary um, in order to, for them to uh, complete the task more quickly. Thank you. Next slide. Um, now we want to go over certain things that we kept in mind while we were creating these phishing uh, templates to kind of circumvent these email protection services that are often in place at larger companies. Uh, for example, proof point protection service. So first of all, these protection services tend to uh, redirect and scramble links. Uh, and when the link is scrambled, the user is redirected to the mail pro protection server's uh, defense service, which uh, analyzes the URL and the website and uh, whether 
determines whether or not it is malicious. And if it is, it will indicate that the website has been blocked and it will search um, the mail server for any other instance of this uh, link and block all of them for the rest of the users. Uh, these email protection services also warn against external senders uh, via like a little pop-up above the email. Uh, they also sandbox and test links and attachments uh, in these emails to kind of, uh, as, as like another line of defense. So when a user opens these attachments or potentially malicious links, uh, then the defense team can be aware, um, can be made aware if they are malicious. Uh, these email protection services also like to scan emails for like certain templates uh, or formats to discover potential passwords or banking information and sensitive information as such that are being shared um, in plain text through the emails. And last, they also try to detect spoofing by matching the IP address of the sender to the IP address of the alleged domain that the email is being sent from using SPF, which is Sender Policy Framework, to kind of detect uh, whether or not an email is being spoofed. So keeping these in mind, we have decided to impersonate two people from uh, Orbital Weapons. First, we have Saul Solper, who is the CEO, for which we can apply um, authority, intimidation, and urgency to kind of... Uh, help our, our fish um, be more successful. And the other person that we've, we are choosing to impersonate is Chet Apishart, who is the IT engineer for which we can apply familiarity, consensus, and trust. So this is the first uh, email uh, phishing template. This is one of two that we're using in this uh, phishing campaign. Uh, this email is basically an email reaching out to Evelyn who we know who is more familiar with the company, so we can't really reach out to her through these like mass, mass phishing attacks. We have to be very, um, very cautious and very detailed with our phishing attempt, kind of like a whaling attempt that Lawrence mentioned earlier. Um, we are telling her that, you know, the other senior accountant, Andy Chang, is out um, on sick leave, and there is some very urgent information that is required um, to complete a transaction with um, a supplier of orbital weapons that needs to be finalized before the weekend. And we are reaching out as Saul Soper, the CEO, and to kind of impose that sense of urgency and authority. Um, furthermore, there is familiarity and trust uh, between this like communication because as the senior accountant, we can expect that Evelyn has had, connect, uh, has had contact with Saul Soper in the past. And there's also consensus as we are also bringing in Andy Chang, who is a uh, coworker of Evelyn's and she is familiar with him. So the way that we uh, kind of pulled this off is we were able to spoof orbital weapons to uh, have the I in orbital weapons be an L and it's kind of like more difficult to identify that it is not you know, the legitimate link. And um, in the second slide, we will tie in the second part of this operation. Um, next slide, please. Where um, we reached out as Nakamura Industries, which is the supplier that we are trying to ring in that uh, is expecting supposedly the transaction. So there's two layers of communication, which makes this seem even more legitimate. Um, and also we are reaching out um, to kind of let Evelyn Sanders know of the procedures of this transaction. And we also attached it within a form of a PDF so that these uh, mail protection services cannot be scanning for that, the information and the format um, that, you know, we're kind of communicating these like sensitive information so that we can bypass that. Um, the, this next uh, phishing template is one where we're targeting Jory Saltman, who is uh, the intern, of course. Um, for his email, we, we're able to go with a more like company-wide approach and incorporate some consensus. Uh, and we were reaching out as chat Apichart to kind of tell Jory to reset his password. And as Jory is an intern, he's not very familiar with, uh, you know, the, the operations of this company. He will likely think that, you know, this password reset link is a legitimate process and it is something that the company uh, constantly does on a very common basis. So he is very likely to, uh, Pa press the password reset credential link. And to pass it on to Robinson for the next part. Thank you. Um, so the f one of the first things about infrastructure that our team had to decide on was how to buy the fake domain. So there's two ways of going about with this. You're either gonna buy an expired domain or a new domain. And Swift recommends like 
during a fishing engagement that you buy a expired domain because of the following considerations. Uh, the first is website categorization. So if you go to any of these websites, such as like sitereview.bluecoat.com and you enter a URL in there, it'll come back with a category. And this category is a classification of a website depending on what, what the website is. So you, it could be categorized as um, business, education, or, or financial services. So if you buy an expired domain, then it's already categorized, which makes your um, fake domain look more legit. <clears throat> the second is new domains might just automatically be blocked. Um, Jessica mentioned that with um, Proofpoint and all that, all that like new technology. Um, when you see a new domain sending you emails, um, it might be flagged as suspicious by, from a, like a security analyst's point of view. And lastly, uh, domain history. This is kind of to sum everything up, but uh, factors such as how old the domain is, if the domain was already trusted, and um, the category, they, they're all big factors to decide if, um, you know, the phishing will work uh, from the fake domain. So since our team could not find a expired domain for OpenWeapons.com, we went down the the uh, new domain route. So we went on DNS twist.it and at the bottom here, you can see that the L and the I are changed. So at a quick glance, um, a lot of people may fall for it because it looks pretty close to each other. Okay, so on to the next part of infrastructure was cloning the website. So Swift used a tool called the Social Engineering Toolkit and we use that to clone Orbital Weapons login page. So on the left, you can see right here, this is what their login page looks like. Uh, actually, these two screenshots are here. So this is the login page and if you scroll down, it just per ask for your username and password. So we cloned that and we put that on our fake domain. So you might be asking why we would go through all the effort to just clone a login page and whatnot. And that's to steal credentials. So. When Jessica was talking about the phishing template used by Chet, what we can do to fish them is to point um, the users to our fake domain. So by cloning the website and putting it as our, as our fake domain, the phishing template can link to this website. And then once users enter their credentials on this website, we steal them. So this fake domain steals credentials using two separate PHP files. Um, so when users input these, input their values onto the, onto the website, um, it's these PHP files are just looking for the input and putting it to a file right here. So how it works is there are two files. One file is looking for the username and password. And the second is looking for the two factor code. And the reason why we have two is because the username and password and the two factor code are on two different web pages. So we need two different um, PHP files to look for them. So all this is doing um, is just looking for a post request for the username and the password. This is all just for formatting, but a post request is basically when a user sends data back to the website. So what this PHP file is looking for is the User, the user's input for the username and password, and it picks it up and puts it into this file called credentials.txt. And the second file is the same exact thing, but it's looking for a different value. It's looking for a post request on the two-factor page for the two-factor code, and it'll be put into this credentials.txt file as well. So let's have a quick demo on what I'm talking about because this looks very complicated. So. Like I said before, this is the actual login website. It's on orbitalweapons.com slash contact, and it's a login page. Orbital weapons with an L right here is our fake domain. So if I would ever to enter information, um, click login, you see that 2fa.php got executed. And this file basically took the credentials of the username and password. And for the duo, we're going to add, you know, the duo two-factor code and click login. 
And if I go to terminal right here and I cat the credentials file, we can see that all the information that I inputted got caught, including the two factor. So let me go back to the slides. All right. Oh, uh, one thing to note though, is the way we did it was very manual. Um, I'll be passing out to Gabe to kind of talk about other phishing frameworks that'll make uh, phishing easier and your life easier. Yeah. Thank you very much, Robinson. But yeah, just as he said, the way that we did it was very, very manual and hands-on, but there are actual like frameworks and other software services that you can use to automate a lot of these processes so that you, know, you can be a lot less hands-on. And one of those services is Mailgun. Mailgun is basically a service that attaches API, which is just like a, you can think of it as just like a small piece of code for every email that it sends and it tracks little things about each of the emails being sent. For example, it can track when and if a user opened the email that was sent, whether or not they you know, opened any attachments, uh, whether or not the email was bounced from their uh, email box, stuff like that. And that makes it a very powerful tool for email blasts. And when you are using a lot of the phishing tools like GoFish, uh, then you'll be able to basically get a lot of good information about how effective that tool was. And GoFish being a phishing framework specifically designed to create templates as well as little pieces of information on each email that is being sent that helps that phishing email go through mail filters that we talked about earlier. And it also has this really nice dashboard that you can see on screen here. It tracks things such as how many emails were sent, how many were opened, how many opened the link, and how many actually you know, submitted data to whatever payload you were delivering. And all of these things together allow you to rely more on the templates, rely more on the API rather than having to manually create the PHP login pages like we did. And every situation is different. So sometimes this kind of automatic process won't really work because whatever target you're trying to fish has a lot of unique aspects to their organization. But generally speaking, these kind of services can make your life a lot easier when doing phishing operations. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be going over actually uh, sending out the fish. So uh, next slide. So yeah, uh, this is just pretty much an encapsulation of everything we've gone over so far. So we're taking stuff from the OSINT phase, the uh, social engineering phase, and also using the infrastructure that we already set up. So yeah, just uh, first off, there are some common things you'd want to avoid. So since we picked out targeting Saul Sulper as one of the people we want to impersonate, if we were able to find like, let's say uh, other social media accounts like Twitter or Instagram, and we see that he is on a vacation, we don't wanna be impersonating an email coming from him when he's on vacation, because that's gonna get just caught out really quick just by people looking, seeing, oh, hey, he's on vacation. He's obviously not gonna be sending out an email or probably not gonna be sending out an email asking um, Evelyn Sanders for something to do with accounting. Uh, next thing is when sending out a fish, there are a bunch of different uh, strategies and thought processes uh, that can occur. So one of the major ones would be sending out a fish on, let's say, a Friday around late. So people at the end of the work week may be a little bit fatigued, not thinking straight. And also, if you are able to get a click and able to get onto their, uh, the target's infrastructure, they might not have people on staff on the weekends to be able to uh, try to kick you off as you're on, let's say on a weekend or an, on a holiday. And the final thing is to be mindful of time zones. So if you are on the West Coast, uh, trying to fish someone on the East Coast, you don't wanna be sending an email after hours for them. So like, let's say it's 4 p.m. on the West Coast, that would be 7 p.m. on the East Coast. So you don't wanna be sending out a phishing email 
then because uh, much like with Saul being on a hypothetical vacation, it would just be the same thing. You obviously would see, oh, this was sent after hours. That's probably not going to be sent from the CEO. And now I'm going to throw it back to Robinson to go for some closing. Thank you. So um, since this was more of a offensive presentation, uh, we'd like to give five tips to defend against phishing. So the first is when you're doubting uh, an email, uh, see if you can try to follow up and contact either the organization or the sender to confirm if the email was actually sent. And the reason why uh, you can do that is because the people behind the phishing operations may not have set up sending while doing their infrastructure. They, uh, no, receive, no, sending, sorry, sending. So like if you were to send an email back to them, um, they don't have the infrastructure to reply back to you. And if it, the email is already fishy and there was no reply, that, that just like adds up, everything just adds up to make it more suspicious. The second is to be careful what you post on social media. So going back to what we found in OSINT, everything was on LinkedIn and all this information can be used against you during a, a phishing engagement. So be careful what you post online, even outside of LinkedIn. Um, the third is to always use MFA when it's available, multi-factor authentication. Um, the reason why is because if your username and password were, were like leaked or anything or like stolen, um, MFA can be the, the like another form of authentication that the attacker has to, has to use in order to um, authenticate as the user that they're trying to log into. Lastly, always be wary of emails from higher authority or urgency. You don't want to be pressured or tricked into doing something because you are pressured by an email from someone such as Sol Solper or, or if there was a deadline, like a very, de like very close deadline before the weekend ends. You don't want to fall for these types of traps. And the last is a website called Gotfish. So it's this website right here. Um, the reason why I link this as the fifth tip is because when you en encounter a phishing website, these are uh, steps laid out for you to investigate and also report um, phishing websites, phishing domains, and kind of do your port, uh, part to publicize the, this information so other companies or, and such can like, um, you know, get that information. So the next, the next thing I would like to talk about that you may have seen in the bottom left corner is the MITRE attack framework. So these really long um, tactics and like titles, they're basically just strategies that are mapped under this gigantic framework. So our strategies mainly were around three sections. So one of the first ones was recon. So under recon, we had three tactics. We gathered info about the software. So that's what T1592 uh, subtactic two is. So it's just basically saying we gathered information about the software. We also gathered um, information about the business relationships between Orbital Weapons employees. And lastly, we also identified the roles of these employees. So we know that Chet is IT engineer. We know Ricky is um, threat intel engineer, things like that. Second, since this is a phishing engagement, um, our initial access was through two phishing um, strategies. So one was through um, a link. So we linked, we pointed users to a, our fake domain um, to steal creds. And the second was through a third party service. So um, Jessica mentioned that we, we uh, created the template to impersonate another third party company in, in order to trick um, the users. And lastly, for credential access uh, on the fake domain, we set up a, um, we set up two PHP files to grab the username and password as well as two factors. So these two, these two, these files fell into these two um, tactics. Uh, 
So that concludes the end of our presentation. We'd like to thank CSAF for giving us the opportunity to present on phishing. Um, Cybersecurity Awareness Month is important, and I hope that everybody here learned a, a thing or two about phishing. Um, these are just some links I've left here if you haven't registered or if you need to see the schedule. Um, we also left our a link to our slide deck. This is public, so if anyone were wanted to refer back to it, uh, feel free to do so. Thank you.